was dark when she got ready. She packed up her things. She looked outside to see if the first rays of sun were visible, if the sky was brightening on the horizon, because that would allow her to set out. She set out by herself, doing the work that women have done for millennia to go tend to the body of someone she loved. It's important that we not rush ahead to these moments, to the moment that we know is coming. It's important that we not rush ahead to that, but that we stay here with Mary in that early morning where all she feels is grief. She's exhausted from crying and worrying and replaying the events of the days that had just passed. She is going to tend to the dead, not the living. There's no hope for her, her friend is dead. And she sets out in the morning alone. In the distance, when she gets closer, in the distance she can see the tomb and she sees that something is different. The stone is rolled away and this is not good news. Mary assumes that they've taken Jesus's body, which, which is a sacrilege and a heartbreak. And she gets closer and she peers in. And the tomb of stone is empty. What's so important to understand about this day is the moments before we knew he was gone and that the Romans hadn't taken him. What's so critical is not to jump over that Mary was absolutely saturated in grief and she had lost all hope and she had gone to tend to the dead. We are living in a time right now where we are not sure we are not sure what we will find. We are setting out in grief. And even if we see the stone rolled away, we don't know how it will turn out. These moments in Mary's story are our story. The sun is coming up. The tomb is more visible, but what's not visible is her future and what's to come. Behind me stands the world's sixth largest cathedral. And people have been coming to this place for a hundred years to sing the songs and celebrate that God is alive. One thing we have learned from that early morning long ago when Mary set out in grief and from our own season of fear and grief and loss and confusion. One thing we've learned is that God is at work in the dark, bringing new life, new opportunities, life where there was death, light where there was dark, hope where there was despair. This Easter season, we will eventually emerge from our homes into the dawn of a changed world. A world where we've learned in ways we never imagined how connected we are to one another, how literally dependent we are on our neighbors who are scientists and doctors and teachers and caregivers and bus drivers and grocery store clerks and delivery men. And we've actually seen with our own eyes the impact we've had on our planet as the sky clears over the world's largest cities. And one final lesson of Easter this morning is that our wildest imaginings for what healing and wholeness might look like for ourselves and for our communities, for our planet and for our economy, pale in comparison to God's imagination for what is possible. Let this Easter that comes after a long season of grief 
work on you. Let parts of you that had grown cold and dead and weary and exhausted come to life. Let your imagination and God's work together so that one day when people look back on this time in our history, what they will see is a people inspired to set the world on fire with love, which is what we know now to be the ending to that story. And as we emerge from darkness into light, let us sow seeds of hope where there was despair, connection where there was division, healing where there was brokenness. And when we do that, then our imagination begins to approach God's and the angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven will sing hallelujah and that chorus will ring throughout the world. So let's let this Easter be like that one and let's set the world ablaze with love. Amen. Amen.